great. All right, good afternoon. Welcome to Assistive Technology, or AT, in the writing process. My name is Jen, and let me first start by just letting you know a little bit about me. That's me at my wonderful standing desk uh, in my office in the Ed Roberts campus in beautiful Berkeley, California, which is where I'm coming from today. I have a single subject teaching credential, which I got after I got my undergrad degree. And student teaching is what taught me that I was not cut out to be a classroom teacher. And I did other things. And then I ended up getting a master's in special education. And while I was getting my master's, I was introduced to assistive technology. And I was hooked. So I've been an AT specialist for over 18 years. I started in about 1999. So technology has changed quite a bit in the 20 years, 18, 19 years since I've started doing assistive technology. And I am RESNA certified. RESNA is a licensure, a national licensure for assistive technology and other types of specialists. So that's a little bit about me. Before we get into specific tools, I wanted to introduce you a little bit about assistive technology. It's important to understand what assistive technology is and what it is not. So uh, just a quick overview. Assistive technology are access tools. That means that they bridge access gaps to allow a student to access curriculum, access content, access participation. They are not education tools, which means they do not in and of themselves advance a curriculum. Of course, they can assist curriculum. And so the example I love is a whiteboard or a chalkboard. That's a chalkboard because a whiteboard doesn't look as striking on a white background slide. A chalkboard or a whiteboard is a tool that in and of itself teaches you nothing but can be leveraged to teach you many things. So just keep that in mind. I'm going to show you a variety of tools and talk about a variety of tools. And so it's important to keep in mind that uh, actors do not teach. They can support teaching, but they do not in and of themselves teach. All right, so moving on. Before we go anywhere else, I just wanted to talk about ways to produce text because um, people often say oh, my student has trouble writing and what they might mean is my student has trouble producing text and so I just wanted to get this one out of the way at the outset so that everything else that we talk about uh, is overlaid on these ways of producing text and so let me just deal with them one by one if you have questions you are more than welcome to hit your raise the hand, hit your chat. Karen, my moderator, will be happy to cut in and let me know. She is at home with her grandchildren, so her mic is largely muted, lest you would all die from the cuteness of their coos. Anyway, ways to produce text, and produces in quotes for reasons that will come apparent as I move my way down this list. Handwriting is the way we all know. It is the way that many of us have been taught for years upon years. The number of years that children are have spent practicing and learning handwriting is uh, extensive. So it's fast and, <laughs> yes, it is cute. It's fast, it's easy, it's got that kinesthetic component that is very helpful for certain learners. Of course, the cons of it are that it's difficult to edit, it's difficult to copy, and it may be, if you're me, difficult to read, which is why I don't handwrite. The next production method is typewriting, which our students are taught far less compared to handwriting. Uh, it could be measured in minutes or hours rather than days or years. So, of course, the pros, typewriting is that it's really easy to uh, edit text. You can insert. It's really easy to copy text. And it is faster production if you can touch type. And of course, the cons are uh, that 
in addition to the con of many students not being taught how to touch type, which is a whole other discussion that we will have a different webinar on someday. Um, but that you have to, it's harder to get out a computer and start it up and open the document to get all ready to type than just grabbing a paper and pencil. And the other piece is that you need to know that keyboard layout, right? At the very least, you need to be familiar with the keyboard, even if you're not familiar with how to keyboard with touch typing. So the next production method, people are like, well, that's not a production method. So hear me out. Audio recording, most people want to jump to dictating first. So why don't I do that? Why don't I jump to dictating first and then jump back to audio recording? Dictating, if you can dictate, it's very rapid production. It can be more rapid than typing. Um, the cons of dictating, though, are that it is prone to misrecognitions. Even the most accurate dictating will never be 100% accurate, even if it's very close. In contrast, if I am typing, as long as I type T-H-E, the will always appear on the screen. But if I say the, I might have of, I might have on, I might have other things that pop on the screen instead of the. So it, misrecognitions are a part of dictation. It requires a quiet location. It requires a dictation voice, which is a different voice and a different speaking task than talking. So most people think, well, they can talk out their ideas, so they could just talk to a computer. But it is a different task. And so it needs training. It needs practice. And in addition to the dictation voice, you need to speak your written syntax and punctuation. And so speaking written format, written order is a strange thing. And speaking punctuation is a very strange thing. And so for all of those reasons, um, and then if you add on someone who has a stutter or someone who has a difficult time organizing their thoughts or who has some speech impediment besides a stutter, dictating is very inaccessible to them, not an access tool, but an access barrier. And that's why, now we'll jump back to audio recording, audio recordings can be really wonderful because they are um, as fast and easy in many ways as dictation, but they are forgiving of accents. They are forgiving of speech irregularities. They are forgiving of that spoken, thinking out loud syntax. So um, the cons of audio recording, of course, that you need some recording tool. You, just like dictation, need a quiet space. And then you or someone else needs to subsequently transcribe. Now, I think that that subsequent transcription, even if somebody else is doing it, is great because it happens asynchronously, which means when someone is transcribing the recording, it's a different time than when I'm making the recording. And what that means is that person transcribing the recording has no scribe influence on me when I'm making the recording. And so even so I can take my own dictation, which can be very helpful using some of the um, drafting tools that we'll get to. And that's great. But also, even if someone else takes my dictation, I reduce scribe influence because they're not happening at the same time. So that was a lot to say on one slide. But I just wanted to get that all out. So these are all different ways to produce text. I am not going to be talking about them more. Instead, I'm going to be talking about the composition process. So without further ado, let's get to that. So I like to call the writing process the composition process because, like I said, when I talk about the writing process, people sometimes think I mean text production process, and I don't. I mean the composition process. And it has several components. First, there's capturing the ideas, and then there's organizing the ideas, 
And then there's composing a drawing where I integrate those ideas. And then there's reviewing and revising that draft. So I know that you have different, there are lots of different writing process breakdowns. I have broken it down to those four today. Um, just to help us look at this process. And of course, the challenge of the, in big quotes, writing process is that everyone has their own writing process. The first day of my student teaching class on how to teach English, our teacher had us all write down our writing process. And of course, there were about 25 students in that class. And you can imagine there were 25 different writing processes about what pieces, what parts you do first. And so it's that's just a challenge to acknowledge that everyone has their own writing process and also that different types of compositions lend themselves to different writing processes, different composition processes. And so I want to be clear, even though I'm showing all these different tools, there is no one right way to write and there is no one right tool to use. And so I'm gonna give you tools that you can add to your toolboxes so that you and maybe the students you work with have the opportunity to leverage a variety of tools. So let's start with that first step, the capturing of ideas. And even that needs to be broken down further because ideas come from many sources. First, there are ideas that you generate that come out of your head. So I'm not going to be talking about those ideas because those ideas, the generation of the capturing of those ideas is going to be in whatever space you are organizing your ideas in. So we'll get back to ideas you generate when we talk about organizing our ideas. But there are lots of ideas that you don't generate here, but that you find in different places. You find them in print sources, you find them in digital sources, and you find them in multimedia sources. So how you capture the ideas is going to depend on the sources where you are finding those ideas. So um, let's dive into those different sources. So first, capturing ideas from print sources. Remember, print sources, worksheets, books, documents. You might choose to photograph them with the camera that many of us carry in our pockets or you could scan them. So you may choose optical character recognition. Um, that's what OCR stands for, optical character recognition. And what that means is I'm taking an image of text and then I'm magically converting it to text as if somebody had typed it in. And the beauty of digital text as if somebody had typed it in as opposed to an image of text is that I can select that text. I can copy that text. I can have that text read back to me. So um, it can be valuable. And what I have shown here, this is one particular iOS or iPad iPhone app that is uh, free if you just want to hear the text, if you want to actually export it in any way, shape, or form. It's a one-time $5 add-in uh, cost, but it's called Prismogo, P-R-I-Z-M-O-G-O, -O. Prismogo. This is an iris scan pen. I have shared with Karen, the moderator, a PDF that has all these slides and has notes with these types of items in them so you can have lots of different names of items. So that's one way to capture uh, print ideas that come from print sources. Next, you have ways of using highlighters. And I've chosen two pictures that show different ways 
to use highlighters and different types of highlighters than you might think of when I say the word highlighter. Because most people think of that fat yellow pen that you drag along a paper, and that's great, uh, but that's not the only highlighter tool there is. So I'm gonna first look at this picture on the right. And what this is a picture of is highlighter tape. So it's kind of like sticky note a level adhesive, so not really strong adhesive, um, with translucent plastic tape, and you can put it over text in a book. And so that's great if your source is a book that you can't mark up with a highlighter pen. One strategy I have heard people use when they use highlighter tape is actually to have, uh, like your bookmark, have a bunch of strips already cut out and put on your bookmarks. You can just pull them off and put them on really easily and you're not trying to measure out to get it just right. Another way to use highlighters is these are our highlight sticky notes. And you can put them over text, but they also, in this example, these colors correspond to different themes in this novel. And this reader is putting those color highlighter tabs on the pages that show examples of those different themes. So just giving you ideas of other ways to leverage highlighter tools. And then there's summarizing and copying text. And of course, you can summarize with any of those text production methods we talked about. Um, and you can summarize in lots of different ways. So you can summarize on the document itself in margins. You can summarize um, using post-its, which is what this is a picture of. This person puts post-its, a big stack of bigger post-its in the back of a book, writes all their notes as they're reading, and then that person can then go and transcribe their notes into a document, a digital document subsequently. So you can do it in the margins. If you've got a touchscreen tablet, you can do it on the touchscreen tablet. You can do it on the computer. So there are lots of ways to capture ideas from print resources. Next, we also have digital resources. So how do we capture ideas from digital resources? And so we could use screenshots, which is just taking a picture of the screen, and we might leverage that same optical character recognition in that screenshot to convert the text in the maybe PDF image file into actual typed text. Or we might just copy the text using copy paste. And we might even use something called highlight capture. And let me go ahead and show you highlight capture just to see what that is. So hold on just a minute. Let me go find where I need to be. There is where I need to be. Let me get there and let me show you highlight capture. So I'm in the Google Chrome um, browser. And yes, you see what I see. Great. I'm in the Google Chrome browser. This is an Atlantic article, Have Smartphones Destroyed a Generation? And I want to highlight this text that I've just selected. So I happen to have an extension called uh, Super Simple Highlighter. So you notice these are ones that I have captured before, and I can set the coloring. But if I want to capture this one, I've selected it and now I'm going to right click on it. And here I have my super simple highlighter tool. And in my options, I can even change my colors from color names to, ID, to labels that might help guide my note taking process like main idea or supporting idea or theme X or theme Y. And so if I do this, then I click that. And now that is selected. And now I can see all my highlights captured right here. So that's a way to 
Um, that's a way to go ahead and use highlight capture to be able to um, capture your ideas in digital format. All right, we're back on my slide. And then, of course, the last way is just summarizing the text, right? And you can do that various different production methods. And you can do it in a, like, this is a sidebar here. This is a sidebar. And you can also use comments to make your summaries. Or you can use a separate document. So we've captured text from print format. We've captured text from digital format. What about multimedia sources, like a lecture, discussion, video, webinar? There are some challenges, and we just need to acknowledge these. And we're not going to fix everything with this. But some of the challenges are that there are challenges capturing the content, because it moves too fast, or maybe it's hard to hear, or maybe it's not that it moves too fast, but there's just never a pause, and you need a pause to capture it. So that can be challenging. There can be challenges, challenges synthesizing the information, because note-taking, capturing content is a dual process, because you're intaking information. At the same time, you're synthesizing and processing that information. And so that's a multi-layered cognitive task that is really hard for some students. And then finally, um, I want to compare live to recorded presentations. I'm guessing that many of you know about Khan Academy, the math videos and other things too, but started out as math videos. That whole empire was started because Salman Khan, the founder, was tutoring his nephews or nieces. He was in Boston. They were in Florida, so he was doing it online. And he would record their sessions and then put them on YouTube, and they could watch later. And his cousin said, we prefer watching the video than being with you live for all of these different reasons. They can pause, rewind, play it at different speeds. I don't know if you guys know that YouTube lets you play back at different speeds. And they can also have the comfort to watch when and where they're focused. Um, so for me, a recorded presentation can be more accessible than a live presentation. But of course, a live one, you can ask questions and you can participate in discussions. And so I just want to acknowledge those things. Now let's talk about capturing. So capturing content from a capturing ideas from multimedia content is kind of a two-step process because you have to first kind of capture the content, record the content. So that might be photographs or screenshots, right? So when I'm watching a lecture, I am taking photographs of slides. Um, it, if I'm not given the slide beforehand, I need to have access to it because it's got content I want to subsequently use. I need to capture it somehow. I'll photograph it. Um, if it were presented on the screen like this webinar, some of you may be taking screenshots to capture information. You can also. and see if that, oh, it's back, never mind. So with audio recordings, it's really nice if you can have something that can bookmark for key points. Let me actually show you what that looks like. So let me go share to show you what that looks like. So this is a Chrome tool called Mic Note. It is a freemium tool, which means some features are free and some features are for fee. Um, and Karen, did you want to say something? Okay. The free version of Mike Note, Mike Note, lets you 
record for up to 10 minutes. So let me show you how to do this. I'm going to record. Hi, now I'm recording. I want to talk about how to make a burrito. So the first thing I need to do is get a tortilla, okay? And once I've gotten a tortilla, then I need to get some cheese. And then once I've gotten some cheese, I need to make get some filling and I need to put it on burrito. Uh, sorry, put it on the tortilla. And then once I've got the filling on the tortilla, then it's probably cold because I left it all, it was all leftover. So I need to put it in the microwave to heat up. And after it comes out of the microwave, then I can add salsa. All right, I'm going to stop recording. And now I've got this recording bar up here that has all these little white lines in it. And maybe you notice that every time I hit enter and I started typing again, I got a little number here. These numbers are bookmarks in the recording. So I can play back. Now I'm recording. I want to talk. And I can jump to this part of my recording. Put it on the burrito. Did you see how that jumped? So that's a way that I can record and I don't have to capture everything. Maybe I'm not someone who is really good at that multi layered, multitask cognitive process, but I could have some kind of a symbol. Uh, guide where I use an exclamation point or a star if it's an important thing or I do a question if I don't understand it or I do uh, a T if it's going to be on the test and so I might use some combination of the recordings and very minimal notes and then I can go back and listen to the recording right and fill in my gaps. So let me go ahead and get you back to my file that we're looking at. Thank you for your patience. I come back and forth between these. Okay. So here we are. So once we have recorded the content, right? Once we have recorded the content, then we need to summarize or transcribe that information. So again, any of those production processes. And of course, that raises the big question, where do I summarize all that? So that gets into the next step of our writing process. So that was all the first step of our writing process, just capturing ideas. Now we need to organize those ideas. And so how do we organize those ideas? So first, there are some questions to consider and some preferences to determine. Are you going to capture the ideas and organize them in the same place? Like, are they going to be in the same document? Or are you going to do different documents? And if you're going to do different documents, because maybe you're using uh, a mind map for uh, your organization and you're using Google Docs for your drafting, right or or your notes then how are you going to transfer from one place to the other and so just have those pieces in mind for your organization let's skip down to the third one actually so in the same vein are you going to organize your ideas and then draft in the same place so your final draft often needs to be in a document format, although maybe it's a PowerPoint format, slideshow format, but if it needs to be in a document format, do you want to organize your ideas in that document or in some different document, and then how are you going to get from one place to the other? It's just important to consider these pieces. Now, for me, once you've dealt with those baseline considerations, a more fundamental important consideration is are you going to create your organizational framework first or are you going to get all your ideas first? Different people need different sets of processes. And so for some people, 
especially if you have a process where you are doing a lot of ideas that you are generating out of your head, maybe you just want to get all those ideas out first. And then what you have out will kind of lead you to create the structure. Other people want their structure first so that they can take all their ideas and just plug them into the structure they, so they know what kind of information they need to gather and where it's going to go. So different people work different ways, and it's important to acknowledge those different processes. So once these considerations are out of the way, let's talk about actually organizing ideas because there are numerous varied, myriad methods for organizing ideas. So, and I have included both some digital and some physical methods here. So, for example, some people might like graphic layouts, like mind maps, or this picture on the right is just different colored sticky notes that somebody has used to organize. Now they're going to need to transcribe all that later, but that may work just fine for them. That's fine. Now, my mind map picture here, I very deliberately chose this picture because many times when people think of a mind map, they think of a center bubble with lots of bubbles radiating out from it. And I personally find that structure obfuscating and clouding the hierarchical structure of English written structure. And so English written structure is kind of this hierarchical structure. And I think that seeing it in this layout is usually called something like top down or top down tree. And I think seeing it in top down tree can really help build that understanding of the structure as well as of the content. And so um, I'm going to show you both an example of that and an example of um, the linear outline. So I'll show you this actually in bigger format. This is just a table in Google Docs. I had a student who had to do a compare contrast, and we just pulled it up and we made a Google Doc table, and that's how she did her compare contrast. So let me go ahead and show you those things. Just one moment. Uh, there's a lot of going out and going in when I do this. And so I'm going to wear this one. OK. All right. So we're at our smartphones. Have they? Uh, destroyed a generation, but I'm actually going to go over to this tab. So this is a free Chrome app called, I'll even type it here. Um, let me just, add, it's called Mind Mup. M I N D M U P, not P. -E. So Mind Mup. And the thing that's important to know about mind map, let me delete that guy now, um, is this is not how it looks when you first see mind map. The map theme that is standard is that kind I don't like. I don't like a layout that looks like this. I find that more confusing, and it also doesn't lend itself to my landscape larger, longer on the top and bottom screen. So what I do whenever I open a mind map, the first thing I do is I change that map theme to top down standard. This makes more sense to me. Now. It may not make more sense to you or to your student. That's why I'm showing you this. 
but I gravitate toward this presentation style. And so then I can organize all my different thoughts. This, of course, as you can see, I was looking at Chrome apps and extensions for education. And so I've got all sorts of different types of uh, tools for different types of purposes. So that's mind map. Let me also show you that table. And it was down here. So my students had to do uh, comparing old music with new music. That's what she decided to compare. And she had chosen these three topics. And so then we were just talking music's connection to the listener, judgment, and flow or originality. And this is more um, hip hop she was talking about. And so we just made notes to compare them with these um, bullet items in each cell of the table. So that can give you a way to use. I love using tables, actually, because whatever they're using to draft, they have the ability to make a table. And so that can be really helpful for students. All right, back to our presentation. There are lots of scaffolds that you can include in either organizational structure, whether it's linear like an outline or a table, or graphic like a mind map or a sticky note. You can use templates. You can give categories. Remember, for those people for whom having the structure in place, so categories would be providing the structure, prompt questions, sentence frames. Those are all tools that can aid that organizational process. All right, we've captured our ideas, we've organized our ideas, now we've got to compose that draft. Before we get into supports, I first want to make the case for digital text production. Of course, this requires, and so I should also make the case for keyboarding instruction. Keyboarding instruction gives students access to automaticity of production, the same type of automaticity of production that many students have with handwriting. And so I would advocate strongly for uh, keyboarding instruction to build that automaticity. But uh, once you have that, some some facility with digital text production, either uh, typing or dictation, then I think drafting in digital format supports independent review. I can use text-to-speech readback to read my document back to me. It facilitates editing and revision because it's easy to pull things out, put things in without having to retype or rewrite my whole document. It also enables independent and scaffolded spelling and grammar checking using all sorts of different phonetic tools, talking tools, um, all sorts of different tools like that. And finally, it documents your revision history because you can either save different versions or if you're using Google Docs, you can go see that revision history and so you can have access to that different versions. So. You notice down below the case for keyboarding instruction and practice because it promotes that digital production automaticity. It frees that working memory to work on the content, not the production. Again, I urge you to think about how many years were spent learning handwriting to build that automaticity and what short shrift keyboarding is given these days. So that being said, I'll get off my soapbox and talk about production supports. So there are lots of types of production supports. So let's kind of take these one at a time. So word banks are just lists of words. They could be in cloud format, you know, those, those word clouds that you sometimes see with some words bigger and some words smaller. Um, uh, or they could just be a list of words, right? And the types of things you might include would be like topic words or maybe transition words or maybe compare and contrast words. And these word banks can be in multiple formats. They could be on a slip of paper. They could be on a whiteboard. They could be in a dedicated app. It could be in a text document. There could be in an outline or a mind map. 
Um, and I will show you uh, one easy way that I do using free existing tools in a moment. The next tool is word prediction. The pros of word prediction, word prediction for anyone who has a modern day phone is when you start to type letters and then there's a list of words. It's like, oh, are you typing this word? Because you can just tap this word and I'll auto populate it for you. So that's the, um, that's the uh, word prediction, what it is. I'm going to see if I can still be online without having it uh, cut out on me. So I'm back. Hi. Um, so you can reduce the number of keystrokes with word prediction. And you can also get some compensation for phonetic spelling because with really good word prediction tools, I could type N-A-Y-B and they might predict N-E-I-G-H-B-O-R. So they can predict neighbor spelled correctly from neighbor spelled phonetically. So that's great. But of course, the downside of word prediction is there can be lots of visual tracking from the document where you're writing to the list itself to the keyboard if you're still visually anchored to the keyboard and you're not an automatic touch typer, which many of our students are not. And so that can slow down your writing process, actually, and take more working memory. It can also, if it has a feature, even if it doesn't. So I start typing a couple letters and a whole bunch of words populate. I may choose one of those words, even if it's not the word I wanted. So my thoughts in here go straight out the door and it might derail my entire writing process. So I, I recommend using word prediction with caution. So there are great things that can help, but it can also be uh, a, an impediment as well. Sentence frames I'm not going to demonstrate to you, but sentence frames would be like, you know, I agree with blank because blank. So um, there are lots of different methods to create sentence frames. They are a challenge to find what level of prompting is appropriate, not too much, not too little, how to address the topic at hand. So let me go show you some word banks and some word prediction. So let me go here. All right. So word banks, I'm going to go to my untitled document here. And can you tell I had a burrito for lunch today? Because here's my burrito word bank right over here on the right. And this is just Google Keep. And in Google Docs, I have access to Google Keep. And I could take a note and say somebody else had lasagna. For lunch. So I've got my lasagna word banks, and so I would have pasta and um, lasagna, and I might have a sauce, right? Or I might have next, or I might have pour or spread. So, all right, there's that word bank there. So I can have different word banks um, right on the side as I'm writing in my Google document. Now, maybe I need word prediction help. I'm going to use, I, I personally uh, am going to use this co-writer universal tool. So I'm going to turn it on. And let's see if I have the tool now. If I start typing, do I have it? No. Let me refresh my page and see if I have it once I start. Okay, my co-writer is on. Hey, Jen, can you make can your, you font, make your a font a little bigger? Absolutely, thank you. Oh, thank you. Let me turn it off for a moment. Oh, I'll just go down to there, there. Okay, so my font's a little bigger now. You notice I have predictions for what word I was typing, but I wasn't actually typing any word with H. So if I wanted to type um, 
my greatest desire is to become president of the United States of America. So my, I type M, and you notice there was some text-to-speech echoing for me. My, M, May, more, Mr. M my, mother. Okay, great. So see now, my sentence was my greatest desire, but if I saw mother, I might just start typing that one, choose that one. I don't want to do that. Okay, so I'm going to do greatest. Grrr. Eight. Is. You notice that I'm spelling it phonetically, G O A T A S. It's right there. Greatest. Desire. Let me try that one. Desire. You notice I spelled it D-Z-I-R, and desire, desire is right there. So, Dirty. Desire. so I have the words to hear. Desire. So you get the idea of how word prediction can work. Um, this particular tool also lets me, to, it lets me dictate a word if my spelling is not phonetic enough to elicit the right word that I want in the prediction. Then I can hit this. Um, so let me try uh, is, is. I've got two right there. Two. two. Um, become. Uh, and maybe I'm just really. Um, D -K -M. Okay. Deca become. But of course I flipped the but and does sound. And so it's not getting it. So I could do this. Become. Aquarium visit. There. Okay. So you notice it got become. I had to go back and get rid of this stuff, but I got the word become out of it. So let's head back to my document. Hold on a minute. All right, so we've talked about all of these different drafting supports. Uh, let me give you an example of putting them all together. My son does not have learning disabilities, but he happens to be the son of an assistive technology specialist. So when he was in about second grade, having to make a um, hamburger paragraph, we used a mind type tool to set it all out and then we made an outline from that so he had all his points and then he used recordings to compose each of his sentences and then over the next three days he went back using word prediction to take his own transcription from the sentences he had dictated. So I was able to decouple composition from transcription because he composed via talking into a recorder. So that can be, you can use these uh, various tools in conjunction with each other to support a student. So now we've drafted, now we've got to review and revise that draft. How do we do that? There are a plethora of tools that can support that. So there are spelling and grammar checkers, and those can be embedded or they can be a separate tool. And some examples are talking ones or confusables. And again, for those who came late, my notes for this, the PDF that Karen can share subsequently, for each slide has notes with examples of tool names. You can do text-to-speech readback. You can also leverage annotations. So let me go in and just show you some of those tools. I'm going to show you a, um, yeah, I'll try and show you all of those tools. Let me go 
share my screen again, and I will try and show you those tools. I am right here. Okay, I'm going to turn off my co-writer so that my everything doesn't get too confused. So um, I oh I'm so sorry I shared the wrong ah no I can share I can share this page for part of it. So I'm in Grammarly in my Grammarly website right now, and I'm going to choose this document that has some student writing from a student. Emma, you're so annoying. Please ask if you can be in Van 1000 or else I will ask if I can because I know that Vans 99 through infinity go to the East Bay, but only um, 199, uh, only Van 99 drops off in, um, uh, what is it, Duloc. I don't even remember what Duloc is. Through, oh, it was a, a fantasy name. Through Fairytale Land and through Walnut Creek and Lafayette. So, or Jay began removing six dozen black quilts with petty flaws. And so you notice that a lot of them have underlines, and when I click on them or move, hover over them, I can see some corrections. And if I click on the correction, it will correct. I'm going to undo it so I can continue to show this. Um, so Grammarly is a great tool. You can just copy and paste your document in and have it shown to you that way. I also want to try and see if I happen to have the add-on here called Verity Spell. Mm, continue. Verity Spell is not free, but I uh, really like it. Um, hold on just a minute. Uh, this one is the one I'm using. Sorry, I'm still waiting. I'm not going to worry about it. It pops up as a sidebar over here and has some great confusables, and it also lists words that are sound alikes, it uses usage sentences to show them in different usages. So that can be a really cool tool. I encourage you, it has a free trial. I encourage you to try it out. All right, let me go ahead and try to show one more tool with you. And that's going to be this one. All right, so. Here I am, and these are some more student samples. I'm going to show a tool called Read and Write for Google. Um, just because I like its colored tracking. So I'm going to first make sure that I don't keep reading when I don't. Good. Continuous reading is turned off because I only wanted to read one thing at a time. So I'm going to read this one. Was at by a cluster of plans. Now, what's nice about that, I know that this one's wrong, and I know that this one's wrong, and I know that this one's wrong. I've got those red undersquiggles that tell me that. This is a wrong word because it should be planes. But if I'm just using my red undersquiggles, I'm never going to know that this is wrong. But if I listen to it, I'll have you hear it one more time. Peel Harbor was at a, by a cluster of plans. I can hear the error. And so that's really wonderful. Um, there are lots of examples where I can. Um, so this is another great one from a student. And see what you hear. What do you predict he is going to do? Why? Explain. We is probably not going trick or treating. He also is probably is mad at Jacqueline. He probably will not do anything that week. 
So you can hear some wrong words. You can hear some ex 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 um, extraneous words. So there are lots of nice things that you can do with um, text-to-speech readback. There are lots of errors that you can find in text-to-speech readback um, that can uh, let the student go and use their own skills. And it gives you a great insight into what skills they can identify independently and what skills they need support to identify. So let's go ahead and head back to my files. Hold on just a second. All right. So we've done, sorry, we've done revising. And here are revising tools again. The one I didn't show you, and I apologize, but we're running a little low on time, is giving feedback in digital comments. Um, in Google Docs, you can use comments. You can also leverage digital highlighters or highlighters. And then in Google Docs, you have a suggesting mode, which puts all of your edits as comment suggestions. That one can be a real valuable one for teachers. All right. We've captured ideas. We've organized ideas. We've composed a draft. We've revised our draft. We got to turn it in. And so lots of ways to submit compositions. Print, hand it in, email the digital file, share the online document, or publish it in print or online. Lots of different ways. So let's wrap it up here. There is no right way to compose. There are no right tools, but there are lots of tools that can be leveraged in lots of ways. Composition is a multi-step and often a multi-document process, and so being aware of those facets. And there are a variety of tools for each step, so figure out what works for you. Figure out what works for your students. Any other questions? Any other comments? Any other concerns? Great presentation, Jen. Great. I want you all to notice down in the bottom here, this presentation, you can download that PDF of the presentation at http colon slash slash bit.ly, which is B-I-T period L-Y slash, and is that a forward slash? I'm, I'm always mixing up whether it's a forward or a backward slash. Maybe it's a backward slash. Um, AT dash composition dash OCT 2018 for October 2018. And you can get a PDF with all the notes. Thank you for joining us today. I really appreciate it. Any other final comments? Thanks again for Thanks all again your hard work. Your hard work. No problem. It was good to break it all down like that. All right, we can go ahead and stop the recording then.